and designated a, um, the Taliban and a bunch of other groups, I think, um, at that point. And that, that list has suddenly grown, um, or has since then has grown a great deal. I mean, the interesting thing about the scheme that was created there is that you can be designated as a group for association with other groups. Um, you know, in our, we have parallel litigation, uh, a case we call um, Humanitarian Law Project 4, uh, which we talk about on our website, uh, ccrjustice.org slash HLP. If you scroll all the way down, you'll see that case, which is, uh, has, we've gotten a negative panel decision from the Ninth Circuit, and we're kind of, you know, it's on pause while the Supreme Court decides this case. Um, but the government there said, well, we've never designated a group simply because of association. Then they came back and said, well, we actually looked through our records and we designated one, one group because, solely because of their associations. Then they took a closer look and filed a, a brief that said, well, you know, we actually designated three groups because of their associations. Well, um, when we got a partial win in that case, we moved for um, attorney's fees under the Equal Access to Justice Act, saying that the federal government really had kind of, you know, gone over the line there and the government didn't even contest them when we got a nice... Uh, $12,000 check at the center as a result. Um, but it just shows you, um, uh, you know, that the, the, the designation um, uh, principle is really very open-ended and it's worse outside of the material support statute. Just to add on to that, that the Taliban is not on the FTO list now, but there's a lot of pressure to put them on. And again, it's unclear which list, but then also if you start working with a group like the Taliban, that then in the process of working with them gets added to the list, what is the implication of that? And I should mention also, uh, especially if the website you mentioned was the Constitution Project website, uh, in our report recommending reforms to the material support statute, uh, I had mentioned that, that we have eight specific recommendations and six of them are beside, uh, beyond this case. And a number of them do deal with recommendations to reform the designation process and increase the due process protections to organizations that do seek to challenge their uh, designation, their problems, such as their assets are freezed and uh, they can't necessarily even use any of their own assets to hire a lawyer to make those challenges. So we have those types of recommendations um, as well. But those are not at issue in this uh, Supreme Court case. So I, th I think we have another uh, question at the microphone. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Shane and Lisa. Um, Shane, you were asked by the moderator if, or, or you gave your opinion that if the uh, MSL, the uh, material support law, were further defined, that you're not sure that would actually help much. Um, but then I heard Lisa say that other countries like uh, European countries and Canada have this um, better scheme that it's if you're further, further furthering the terrorist potential of them as opposed to peace efforts. So, Lisa, have you seen that further scheme, that, that more explicit scheme, actually create less problems for them? For example, do we have these kinds of overlap and prostitution problems happening in Canada and Europe as much as here? And if we don't, would that kind of attest to the fact that it would help if we were more specific and narrow? I've seen that it does help because the Canadians um, are free to go forward in this project and any U.S. funder who's been approached raises the questions of this law, basically, of material support and whether the unclarity of whether knowing whether this project to support a peace process that might engage with the Taliban eventually um, is going to be illegal or not. So it, it's, it's definitely a factor in how the different organizations are moving ahead with it. Uh, Canadian fun it's co funded by the Canadian government right now, this peace process project. And Canadian organizations um, like CARE are, are moving forward in supporting it. But others that have more of a U.S. base uh, are saying no to funding it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know offhand really how widespread um, these kind of systems are, meaning laws that are parallel to the material support um, statute. But my impression is, you know, putting Canada one side, it's a common law country, um, uh, that generally most of the civil law countries in Europe don't have systems like this. And in fact, conspiracy laws is, is somewhat uh, unknown to those systems as well. Um, and the U.S. is pushing pretty hard to get um, uh, other developed countries to adopt these kind of schemes, uh, you know. And in fact, they're also pushing through the mechanisms of the U.N. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't... You, I'm sure know a ton more detail about this, but the, you know, the 1267 list through the UN is something you know, the US pushed for after 9-11. Um, uh, so I think you know, by and large these schemes don't exist elsewhere, and so that's another thing that's really you know, um, uh, at stake here. Um, you know, again, the, the, you know, this, this case is about speech, but I suppose um, the way it comes out will affect the perception of uh, whether or not these are workable systems and whether it's a good idea for European countries to kind of accede to the US's pressure. Um, you know, 
and, and of course the list is astronomically long. I mean, it's, it's interesting for folks probably to go to the OFAC website, the Office of Foreign Assets Control at Treasury, which maintains a unified list, a searchable PDF that runs to 414 pages, I think, the last I checked, of sort of triple spaced, um, you know, sort of eight or nine point text um, listing all the groups um, uh, that are on the various lists. Oh, okay. Let me just, I will say this about, about Europe. I mean, I think that the, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is there's actually a lot more financial regulation um, uh, 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 within our, our most of our European friends. Um, and so there's a lot more direct targeting of finances um, and of the sort of interaction of, of, of financial support for terrorist organizations. So I think Shane is right that especially civil law jurisdictions have been more sensitive um, to imputing this kind of guilt, at least directly. But insofar as the sort of government regulation, there actually is a very, very vigorous regime um, of, of interfering with and of sort of government intervention with financing for terrorist groups um, throughout the EU. Thanks. Okay, I see someone else at the microphone. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jason Harris. I'm uh, Congressman Elsie Hastings Legislative Director. And uh, my question, I ask this question because Congressman Hastings has introduced legislation to um, reform detainment practices for suspected terrorists or those suspected of involvement in terrorism. How, how might this ruling that we're talking about, whichever way the Supreme Court rules, affect detainees, whether they're at Guantanamo Bay or Bagram, or if we move them to a prison facility here in the United States? Is, are these statutes that could be used or not, or what's, what's the impact? I, I think there, there are two different levels of impact. There's direct and there's indirect. Um, directly, I think the most important implication of, of this case could be in the extent to which it does or does not provide a means of prosecuting those who are currently held at Guantanamo in our civilian Article III courts. Right? So as the Obama administration continues to figure out what to do with the remaining detainees at Guantanamo, for those who have been pushing, and I'm one of them, um, for, for more trials in the Article III courts, for more use of our ordinary criminal justice system, the scope of the material support statute will have a lot to say um, about how viable an option that is. Uh, and I suspect that that will be weighing on the court's mind when it gets this case. Indirectly, and so far as um, with respect to continuing detention authority, I think it's very unlikely to have an effect, um, mostly for the reasons Shane already articulated, um, but that the, the courts have already required a greater showing um, to justify detention as what we used to call an enemy combatant, um, right, the artist formerly known as, um, than, than, than even the government's arguing for under the material support statute, under their view of the statute in this case. Um, and so I think you know, the way it would show up is more in how it influences the decision to bring cases in the Article III courts and not in the continuing detention and justification for detention outside of that system. Right, and it's hard to imagine. Uh, the government has said they're going to prosecute, what, about 30 people at, uh, at Guantanamo. Um, you know, you can look at the CSRT records and see that there are, you know, about that many folks who are said to have some significant tie to Al-Qaeda, some significant tie to something like the coal bombing or 9-11 or, or, or you name it, right? Um, it's not going to be difficult, whatever the Supreme Court does. Um, with the uh, specific intent requirement or anything else here um, to prosecute those folks under the material support statute. There's a separate question in military commissions, which is, you know, is material support a traditional law of war offense? Remember, the MCA was passed in 2006. Everyone who's, you know, going to be prosecuted under it pretty much has been put into detention way before that, so there's a retroactivity question, which the government can only get around if it argues that all the offenses you can charge under the MCA, the Military Commissions Act, are in fact traditional, you know, offenses against the common law of war, that they were already offenses, the MCA just puts it down into the U.S. Code. Now that's a question the government is going to lose, um, and it doesn't really matter what the, the Supreme Court does here. It's going to lose that because, again, you know, these are conspiracy and material support are just, you know, unknown in, in you know, in concept in, you know, kind of half the world. They have never been traditional law of war offenses. Four justices on the Supreme Court laid this out in great detail in Hamdan. Uh, Justice Kennedy decided you didn't have to go that far. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that, again, is, you know, while just about every uh, charge sheet and the military commissions has material support um, sort of on it with, I think, two exceptions, uh, you know, the flaws with using that as a charge in military commission are not going to be affected, um, uh, and they are probably fatal, uh, although they'll probably only emerge four years down the road when those cases uh, hit the federal courts. Well, I was going to say, just, I mean, just as a point of information, I mean, I think the, the question of whether material support 